I bet I told my mistakes to the ground, to the last person. I'll, I'll warn you guys. I'll, I'll warn you. We'll duct tape it and send it in the corner. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so good. All right. Five basic techniques. Um, inoculate. Yes. Tell me what you inoculate. That you inoculated your environmental flaw. Inoculated. You inoculated your plate with the stuff on the spot. Introduce something. Introduce. That's a good word. Yeah. So you are introducing a microorganism in this scenario. It's medium. Uh, if you get an inoculation, you get a shot with microorganism or parts of So introduce is one of the best words to incubate. What are the organisms incubated uh, in this lab? Well, it's 98.6 body temperature, but even body Celsius. 37, 37. Yeah. And keep in mind, um, each organism has a incubation temperature that they prefer. Um, those optimal temperatures can fluctuate just a little bit. Um, everything in this lab, 37 degrees Celsius, works today. Uh, there may be other organisms that prefer, say, 32, for instance. There was a lab I worked in, maybe 32 for organisms. So, it can fluctuate. It is dependent upon the organism itself. Isolation. What's that mean? Separate. Right, separate. So there might be two instances here where you isolate. Uh, you might want to get isolated colonies, which are just little dots or masses of cells. Or you might want to isolate one organism from a plate that has many organisms. So if you have a plate that's got a lot of different types, that's a mixed culture. And that environmental spot that you guys did the other day, that's what that would be. Um, today, you're actually going to do a straight plate, and you're going to try to get a pure culture in this one. So you'll separate organisms that can be one way separated from the mixed culture or get isolated colonies. And we like to get isolated colonies because you can look to see that all the colonies are the same. And then you can do further testing. So maybe you want to do a skin, maybe you want to do an antibiotic test. There are a variety of things that you can do with this isolated colony. Inspection. You can uh, stain. And the simple stain, I'm really debating whether we're not really in a rush. And if you guys want to do the simple stain today, we, we could do two staining plates. It really wouldn't be that big I, I get mixed up and think I'm in the quarters and I get on some fast pace because it's like a whatever. Be on coffee all the time, craft or something. <laughs> um, we can slow down. So if you guys want to just have an initiation stain day, we can do a simple stain. All the simple stain does is allow you to view the shape. So a wet mount is what you guys did um, the first day where you had the drops and put it onto the side. Um, one of the things that uh, I, the wet mount's a lot easier if you want to inspect your culture if you're hand digging it. Sometimes uh, microbiology, the organ stimulation is kind of high bad thing to take contamination, but it happens quite frequently. So a lot of times people will get samples out of their culture that they're incubating and take a look under the scope to see if it's the same thing. Wet mount does it really quick without staining. The simple stain though still accomplishes the same thing, but it takes a little longer. And then identification. Identification is really taking that a step further and actually identifying what organism it is, whether it is by, say, a DNA analysis method or even just a good old rapid strep test. That's a good example. There's rapid HIVs, rapid streps, there's all kinds of things. Uh, there is a rapid test that will be for um, staph aureus, but a lot of those are. Right, any questions about these five eyes? Right, this one you asked the test question about. Three methods of isolating bacteria. And the whole idea is to get these isolated colonies, these dots are what I'm talking about as far as isolated colonies. And like I said, you can do further testing. But there are three methods. I get to write it on the board here. Everybody else is kind of looking at the pictures. The street plate, the spread plate, and the pull-up plate. The 
history quakes what you guys are going to be doing. And you manually dilute it yourself. And the top portion is showing you um, they do five streaks and four streaks. We're only going to do a three streak. But the whole idea, for instance, with this one, this area is the most populated. You get your colony, you put it on the plane, sterilize, you let it cool, and then drag from there to the next one, and it's like the populated. So the whole idea is that it's the most concentrated in that first streak and the least concentrated in the last streak. And at that point, you can get isolation. But if it's too heavily populated, you just kind of get a sphere of treatment. Now you have to have this solid media, which you can talk about in a little bit different ways to classify media. But it's going to be solid like that TSA thing that you can put in that glass bottle. Now, the next two methods are based on a series of dilutions. Instead of you spreading it out and diluting it yourself, you set up a series of tubes. You're never going to have to do this for me, but I just want you to understand the concept. Uh, I've done milk several times with this with the scrub thing. So let's say your first tube is milk. And then you set up nine more tubes. You put a buffer in each to try to keep that pH or the same level of control. And then you take a mill of your milk, you put it into the nine mils of buffer, you shake it up. That's diluted 10 to the minus one. So let's take, say so you take that diluted, so you take a mill out of there, you put it in the next nine mils of water. That's diluted again, so you get minus two. So I guess to make long story short, your water is down there. Water right there. <laughs> now, possibly that milk would have been too populated and you would have had a hard time getting isolated from it, or even a broth. So that's why they like to dilute it down so that when you get enough plate, they can actually have this isolation. So the scrub plate and the pour plate are set up the same way with the series of tubes. But now you guys remember the blue scrubber and your old uh, tablets. Now let's say we want to take the 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4. Take a mill out of there and you squirt it onto that TSA plate. Take that scrub and you spread it around so it's evenly distributed on that plate. Uh, the side up. So with it being kind of liquidy at first, you have to let it dry. Then you put it. So it's a little time consuming. That's why we I, I don't I don't know that we'll do a spread plate anymore, but it is it, it is a little time consuming by the time your all is actually dry. If you ever know, I can be sitting here at 4 o'clock in the morning, not that I can come at 4 o'clock in the morning. But you like to get them flipped over as soon as possible. Ideally, if you're in the lab, you start that early in the morning, you can flip them over and put it away. So, as far as time goes, it's a little hard to set that aside. It's a, you know, I like to talk about experiment, an example on there. But, um, the poor plate still set up the same way. Um, they make a lot of. Uh, a lot of fancy things now, but they have little bottles of water. So let's say you still take that one milk, like a 10 to the minus 4 or 10 to the minus 5. Squirt it into the medium, shake it up, and then you pour it into the plate, and you got to still wait if it's got to solidify. So that takes a little time. Then you can turn it over. But it's still one of those same things. you got to start early in the morning, but hopefully it's solid by the time you put it in and put it. But here's the difference between the two. The spreader, you're spreading just on top. The pour plate, because all of those organisms are mixed up into that whole thing, can go anywhere. So they can be at the bottom, they can be at the side, they can be at the top. So the pour plate is kind of, uh, remember when I said I had a bed of fruit and jello? That's the fruit and jello. So it's everywhere. But now keep in mind, you can also be on the top. So anywhere. Your goes. And that's how my test question will be asked. So make sure you can describe where you call it to Any questions about pores, roots, or spread? Grace Tolkien's. All right, classification of media. 
You classify by the physical state that's the easy part. Chemical composition is also pretty easy. Functional types where it gets a little complex. Um, as far as the physical state, you either have liquid media, semi-solid media, which is a little bit gel-like. We'll kind of make sure you write that description down. Sometimes I need to go to the test question. A little gel-like. So it's not real solid, but it's not just liquid. Uh, solid media, that TSA thing that you guys use was an example of it. Now, as far as the wall, the auger is what makes it solid. So broth has no auger. Now, I still use, uh, if you guys remember, it's a TSA site. It was cystic soy auger, so it's just cystic soy broth. And then you use a very uh, generic type of media that has all those minimal nutrients in it. So the liquid moves around. No Now, what would the growth look like? What would it look like? Mm -hmm. So, I'm going to get the drag, like the wind, and the heat. What does CSF look like if you got an infection? Now you put it that way. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, like when you have mold on stuff that's liquid. Something yeah, that's sometimes not. you'll have a nice little residue that floats yeah, in it. Yeah, that's like what I was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> try to get it all mixed up in there. <laughs> then you drink it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's the good mold. <laughs> Back in the seventies, in fact. <laughs> Oh, goodness. You know, they thought that a lot of those hallucinations <laughs> and go back to some of my that uh, was responsible uh, for some of those Salem witch trials that some of the witches, uh, the Salem witches, uh, witches had gotten food in the house and so they might have been producing toxins and I guess maybe they acted funny. Of course, it wasn't good for them. It was going to take them away to jail. I got caught. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Her music is here. I love all my little conspiracy theories. And mold clothes. All right. Semi solid media. Semi solid media has a very low percentage of auger. So typically a percent or less. Enough just to make it firm. And they use this for motility testing. So what happens, you guys remember the needle that's in your. Um, Cavity. You take some of the organ and then you stab it into the side of the needle. This is the stab line where you actually see the organs. Now, because it doesn't have hardly any auger, if it's motile, it allows it to move out from the stab line. That part will be flat. The part in the stab line will be chunky. But to the outside, if it is motile, that will be cloudy if it is motile. So semi-solid has very, very little offers. Then you get to solid media like the TSA clay feet, you're going to make um, uh, slants and they actually have to tilt it so it can solidify the stuff. Uh, a lot of people put cultures on there because it's a little easier to do. But the solid media has the most offer. And please know that percentage is be one to five percent. Now, the looks of the growth on this type of offer. Those are the columns. So if you want to have colony formation, you can't do that in, in the semi-solid, and you can't do that in the uh, liquid. you got to do that on the solid. Now, as far as chemical content goes, you can have synthetic media or non-synthetic. Um, sometimes the non-synthetic they call complex. So if I use that interchangeably, it's because a lot of textbooks do as well. So as far as the synthetic, please don't memorize this um, by any means. <laughs> don't worry, we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> I, would, I, I wouldn't have done it either. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to be this way more often. <laughs> I used to have to make my media, now I, mean, I order it. 
this way. I didn't have enough time to make the video here. Um, but we just have to make it. I, I about have the recipe memorized. I'm like, oh my god, I can do that too much. <laughs> make a stock and eat something else. And I want to memorize But if it's synthetic, you know every little component in that meat. So it's got a recipe that is exactly the same. Now, if you've got non-synthetic or complex, typically, and in our blood organ, you'll see that it has a TFA base. Um, but when you add some type of animal extract, like blood, that's the complex component, because you're not breaking down all of those different components of blood. It's just blood. So that's your unknown. So in something that's complex or non-synthetic, an unknown. Functional types, this term minimal, sometimes I'll use the term basal, E-A-S-A-L, basal. All that is, is media that has the minimum amount of nutrients for organisms to grow. An example is the TFA code that we use for the environmental crop, and that's what we use today for the straight type. Um, enriched media or complex, um, and which is sometimes used also in the same terms as complex is, although I kind of want to separate those in the lab. But as far as complex, the blood author would be a good example of complex. Now, there are some organisms that just will not grow on the basic TSA. You add that component of blood, and it will grow on it. So when you're actually encouraging it growth, that's when they get into being an enriched type of Selective media does exactly what it sounds like. Some type of components added, salts, dyes, antibiotics, to select what grows on the plant. So, for instance, if I wanted to grow gram negatives, I would put an antibiotic in, then gram positives, and vice versa. Differential media, a component's added that allows a visual difference. Usually, it's like a sugar. And when the organism ferments that sugar, uh, also, the blood auger is a good example um, based on hemolysis, how it kind of lyses through those RBCs. But now, most things that we have in the lab that we'll uh, actually use in depth is classified as selective media. So, media has good. Um, and in this scenario, you can use it as an enriched Neisseria only grows on the chocolate author, and that's also blood author. It's just like a Hershey bar. If you're really hungry, you might want to eat it, but you're not going to eat it. It will not taste anything like a Hershey bar. Um, the blood author that I have, I still get the chocolate. It's just too tempting to say, no. I just don't like the word chocolate on anything in there. It's just kind of Makes you mad all at the same time that you're not good, but you know. So I get the nice sheep blood, which is a really red off. And it tastes kind of like red. This really, the chocolate really doesn't have much. All right. Um, the tables is like this in the book. Um, it's updated though and actually correct this one. It's a little too much information on it. Um, some of these media examples here, ones that we actually use in the lab, the blood auger. Um, the reason why they stuck it under differential is because of hemolysis of how the organisms lies through the RBC. But the one I really want you to focus on is the mantle salt auger. And I abbreviate it MSA. Now, this particular plate, even though they don't have it on your current chart, this is supposed to be just how it's differential. I'm going to tell you how it's selected. They actually kind of call it this one because it's not a differential. But it has 7.5% sodium chloride, so 7.5% NaCl. That is a very high salt. So not a lot of organisms can withstand that much salt 
but now staff will go on this plate. So this plate is really meant for staffle plants. Fungus will grow on here, but that's not what uh, uh, the purpose of this plate is for. So staffle pots is what we really want on this particular plate. Now the differential component is that it contains the sugar alcohol mannitol. And that's on this differential portion of the paper. You guys should probably yeah. see they put the selected part up here where they selected it in your test. So. But I want you to know it's selected because it has that high salt concentration. It's differential because it has the sugar alcohol mannitol. Now what happens is fermenters, this plate is originally pink to start out with, Fermenters of mannitol will turn that plate yellow. Non-fermenters will stay like a green colored organism on a pink plate. So it does look very different. Now the benefit of using that particular plate is you can differentiate between the pathogen staph aureus and the non-pathogen staph epididymitis, both normal for the skin. So let's say you're trying to figure out if there was contamination in blood, you only saw a couple of cells. Um, if you test it and you put it on an MSA plate and it shows up Staph aureus, Staph aureus is an organism that can become system of protection. So if that's what's showing, then you would go ahead and say patient. But a Staph epididymitis, not really a threat. You have to be so immunocompromised for Staph epididymitis to really do anything to you. But this does help differentiate between the pathogen and not. Is that where they say it's Colorado versus not a Colorado? As far as MRSA goes? Yeah. No, um, well, yes and no. Uh, this is not, they don't necessarily have to use this plate, this, any staff or is, whether it's MRSA or not, will still produce that same color, the yellow. Um, but when you say colonized, staff or is, is normal for it, it's just opportunistic. So, it can cause an infection, given the right scenario. Uh, but when a patient has an active infection, it's causing all kinds of problems, depending on whether it's in the skin, whether it's in the lungs, and that will probably can get out in there at night. But when it's colonized, that means it's just taken up its home and it may not be causing any problems at all. But now the thing about colonized MRSA, um, animals can have colonized MRSA. And a lot of people do studies with uh, domestic animals that have that particular type of organism incorporated into the normal form. You can still get that in colonized because you're not used to that particular strain. And it's funny, I mean, there's all different kinds of strains out there. Some you mix with, some you don't. Some are slightly different. Some can produce different toxins than other toxins. So sometimes if you're infected, you can do it. Just means it took up shop. Macaque auger, let's get down past H, H E auger. Macaque is what I end up using. Um, Macaque auger, I don't expect you guys to know this one for this test, but we use it because it grows gram negatives, and a lot of the organisms that cause UTI infections are gram negatives, and they're transferred from one place where the normal flora to another place where the not. So when you use this plate, you can actually do a colony count because there's certain organisms that swarm and take over the whole plate and you can't do an appropriate colony count without something in the plate that will keep it from doing that. Um, but they'll do their colony count and then they'll find out is it a, enough to say it is a UTI or it's going to lose weight or it's going to go ahead and contract. Urea broth, we don't use the broth, we use the auger. I'll talk about that later. The SIN tube and the TSI tube. The SIN tube is one of these that uh, is a semi solid medium, so it has very little auger in it. Uh, but there is a differential component, and uh, you can find out if the organisms produce H2S. So the tube turns black, and if you open it, it smells like Sulphur City. It's I say you got a little bit of an imbalance sometimes in the digestive system. 
slide incubation I already talked about uh, each organism having their own temperature so they have very very temperatures inspection <coughs> as far as finding out if it's a mixed culture or a pure culture um, that's one of the things that I want you guys to kind of decide with an environmental smog thing um, but if you're doing that on a TSA plate you're looking at the colonies uh, and so when you guys get your plates fed I want you to look to see if the colonies have borders around them, or if they're straight and nice and circular. They're kind of irregular. Some have like different shapes in them. Um, some are very flat, dull. Some are very shiny. And some have color to them. Now you can also, of course, if we take a look under the microscope, and you guys realize that. Uh, when you go the plate route, you've got to go the presentation on the If you go the wet mount, you're off and on and it's right there. Identification. Um, we already talked about other means of identification. Maintenance and disposal. As far as stock cultures, uh, we'll get into this later on in the term. A lot of stock cultures are refrigerated and even frozen. So our freeze dry. And as far as disposal, you have to sterilize all of those plates and remember uh, endosporeformers to be hard to kill back in chapter one. Uh, the autoclave temperature that is at 121 degrees Celsius. And you guys will know that temperature very, very well um, by the end of the term for 15 minutes, 121 degrees Celsius what it takes to kill the spirit. So when you sterilize, you take that temp that it takes to kill that hard to kill organism and that's what you use. Most people use the auto plate. You've got to increase the temperature from the heat as well. But there you go. You can get the spirits. Alright, as far as the microscope goes, you guys know the parts. I might ask you something about uh, total magnification. You know how to figure that out. Ocular time subjectively. some of the stuff, oh, some definitions here. Here's some of these. Reflection. Light hits a no-take object, the rays bounce off the object, and you can see this is, I like this picture, not in your book, but I like it because it kind of shows you the difference between the three. Transmission. Rays pass through the object, but it's got to be something that's transparent, so like glass or water. Um, absorption. Some light goes through, some does not. So, they show you the difference here between transmission and absorption by giving you the dotted line to show you that only some of it passes through. Diffraction, uh, for a light ray bend when it passes near an opaque object. Refraction, you know that is the bending of lines. It depends on the density that the rays are going through or the object that it's going through. The refractive index determines the speed of light through a medium. So, even when you guys are looking through the scope, there is a different refractive index when you look through foil and when you look through air. So, what between your objective and what's between the actual vessel? Magnification, that's just enlargement of an image. Contrast, that is a property of the specimen. You guys uh, remember with the wet mount. Uh, the larger organisms, you periodic organisms, you can see more stuff in there because um, they have more stuff. Prokaryotic cells that are just little rods or dots on there, very simplistic, just look like that shape. So remember that that's why that face is nice because it increases that contrast with something that you can actually work with very well with the light bulb microscope if it's a prokaryotic cell and you're not seeing it. Now resolution, I like to ask this one, that's the ability to distinguish between two points. Measured as resolve and power, and that's the closest you can get to it, still distinguish what you're looking at. Depends upon three things, size of the objective lens, wavelength of the light, and the refractive index of the material between the 
the objective lines and the specimen. So the error is at the refractive index of 1, oil is 1.5. And it increases the thicker stuff is in between. So if it's uh, really viscous syrup or something like that, go up. So once it doesn't move, it doesn't go to the end and go to the top. All right, as far as optical microscopes, max magnification here is 2000x. Um, pretty much, uh, most scopes that you guys will ever come in contact with will be 1000 max magnification. But you can order some fancier lenses to go up just a little bit. So. And you can actually order other lenses that you can actually get the grid. So, but that's the max magnification. Now, the bright field scope, remember that's the scope that we use. Um, we'll focus on bright field, dark field, face contrast, and fluorescent. So the bright field, I want you to know that that is the most common microscope that's used in the lab. And it is good for looking at live or preserved stained specimens. And you guys remember from the wet mount, it isn't that hard for something that's unstained. You really got to try to find it before you back the You got to try a little harder. With dark field, you can look at live unstained specimens, and the only light entering the objectives is from the specimen itself, and everything else is dark. The phase contrast, you can also look at live specimens. Some of these phase scopes, you can look a little bit more at internal cellular detail. There's the opaque rings that you find in the condenser, and they'll take the objective as well. And that'll go ahead and add that contrast that you want to have there. Now this is a fancy phase microscope, why is it not quite like that? But they do vary just a little bit. Now this is the dark phase. So this is what it means by the only light coming in is from the specimen itself. Everything else is going down. And then that's the bright light. And did we get to see any of those in this course? Some of the cultures were too thick with the wet mount. Some of them were fine, some of them were not that great. But it looks like uh, I have a needle. <coughs> and that little open area is where the score is getting ready to fall. Now, with the soil, there's a lot of clostridia. And clostridia are score bumps. Not everything is. A lot of clostridia. Uh, differential and free of Fluorescence, you use a fluorescent standard dye. And UV radiation causes emission of visible light from the dye. And a lot of times, uh, it's not just used for microorganisms, it can be used for a variety of things uh, with diagnostics. You can actually um, stain for certain proteins on the outside of the cell and it'll fluoresce or light up. Um, People can use antibodies that attach to those particular proteins. It's got a fluorescent uh, dye attached to it. It's a little bit. One focal Electron microscope. Electron microscopy. Um, you do have scopes that go past 100,000 X. But what I want you to realize is that you're at least going to get 100,000 X. So the older uh, transmissions, that's all you're going to get is 100,000 scanning or go up a little further. Um, but the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope, you need to know what the beam of electrons is transmitted from the specimen. Now with this one, you are looking more at internal structures of the cell. So how we you know what the Golgi apparatus looks like and the endoplasmic reticulum and all that good stuff. This one is not so good. Here. Scanning electron microscope gives you a little more of a three dimensional image that's a lot cooler than this one, but um, this provides uh, that internal component that you want. Uh, you guys remember um, Bio 207, and we had that uh, electron micrograph. Was, uh, that was the first version. And the lab book that took one of the first labs. 
And it takes you a while to orient yourself to the team. <laughs> That's the same. You look great. Uh, you don't have to memorize this table. Just make sure you know some of the descriptions of the And I think we're getting close to the end here. Now, as far as stains go, you guys remember in A and B taking a look at all the different stains, right? Um, you can look at a lot with me. I'm sure a lot of Dr. Nye. Now, those stains stuck to those parts because of the charge on the parts and the charge on the stain. So these dyes, and even the methylene blue, anything that uh, is out, has a charge to it. So now positive stains are considered basic. They have a positive charge. Negative stains are considered acidic, and they have a negative charge. Now, if you have a positive stain, it's going to bind to something that is negative. That's right. Because if you've got a positive and a positive, it'll work out. That's correct. So now, as far as micro goes, um, most microorganisms will have a negative charge on the surface. So anything that is a positive dye, that's what you want to use if you want to stain the microorganism itself. So positive stains would stick to that outer surface of the microorganism. So it would be attractive, just like my own. Now, some of the examples here, crystal violet, that's the purple one right here. Uh, hematoxylin, remember the pink and purple stain in AMP and the nucleus was always purple? That's hematoxylin. So that means that our nucleus has a slight negative charge. So does the endothelium particularly for the pink cell that side. Uh, saffronin. Saffronin is also a stain that uh, we use in the gram stain right there, and it has a positive charge as well. So gram negative and gram positive does not mean that one has a negative charge and has a positive charge. They both use positive stains, and they both have a slight negative charge on the outside of their surface. Gram, when they've got that term in front of it, is referring to the actual structure of the cellular envelope. So that's why I want to bring this up here. This is the secondary stain in the gram stain. This is the primary stain in the gram stain. So the gram stain period is positive dyes. So the charge on all those dyes used in the gram stain is positive. And it'll always bind to that negative microorganism. So gram negative and gram positive means something else. So you go get that confused. Now negative stains, there's some reasons that you might have to use a negative stain like that. Some structures just don't stain. <laughs> so, if you want to use a negative stain, it stains to everything else around. But sometimes people will use a counter stain to stain the organism. But take, for instance, a bacterial capsule. Organisms have a capsule, not all of them, but a lot of the muscle cause meningitis and whatnot, that protects them from phagocytosis. It's got a polysaccharide base. Polysaccharide can be a little hard to stain this that particular component. So, you stain everything around, you can stain the organism in the middle, and that capsule will just clear it. So, negative staining kind of knocks out everything else, kind of like a dark hair. So, by process of elimination, you can see the structure of the actual one state. Now, an example of an acidic dye, eosin, eosin, pink and purple stain from A and B, and the muscle fiber is all pink, that's eosin. So it is in the same collagen, the name of the cytoplasm. But now with microorganisms, we're going to get that. So negative stains hit that outer surface and they're like. All right, any questions? I've got a couple more guys I want you to know on the chart that kind of makes that
Now, as far as staining microorganisms, there are a couple of vital stains that you can use that will stain live cells. But the majority of the time, most micro labs don't use those. Um, some are a little more carcinogenic to use, so really the traditional dyes typically stay for that. Uh, if you're going to use any of these things up here, you have to kill the microorganisms. Most of the time that's done through heat fixation, where you run your slide through a flame. Uh, we have hot plates out there, and that's how we do it. Uh, you can also use chemicals like formaldehyde, glutarol, and other things like that. Now, under this positive stain, this is the chart I want you to look at the star. Uh, I've got some examples here of basic dye with crystal violet, which I had on the other slide. Methylene blue, methylene blue is this guy here also on your table that's uh, in the little bottle. Uh, Saccharin is that other component of the gram stain. Malachite green, they use in the score stain. Malachite green is very carcinogenic to them. Um, anyway, just know the names of those basic dyes. Some other acidic dyes besides eosin, nigrosin, and india <coughs> Nigrosin and india -E. Now, some of the different stains, the simple stain, which shows just the shape as positive stain, the gram stain is positive stain, but it's gram positive, gram negative. The acid fast, which identifies microbacterial cells like the ones that cause TB or leprosy, is also. Uh, spore stain. Now, the spore stain, you could kind of be tricky with this and stain everything but the spore, so it can kind of be a negative stain, but this most of the time is not. Typically, it's just the capsule that they use for negative stain. Uh, one of the things here that I want you to know, see, you know, this is all positive stain, staining. Sometimes the term special, I don't really like that, but this particular sex that I always use the term special stain. I like to call them structural stains, and I still do in the lab because it identifies the structure. So it just makes more sense. <laughs> Now they've got the capsule under here because you can counter stain that microorganism, which is the example I'll show you next week. The spore stain, though, a lot of times they'll put this under structural stain, and then sometimes you'll see it under differential. I want you to make sure that you know it can fall under both places because sometimes they'll use two dyes, and sometimes they'll use just one. The example I have in lab uses just one. So if it's one dye, they classify it as a structural or special stain. If it's two dyes, they'll put it under the differential for the one. So there's too many ways to stain that stuff. Um, so some examples here of positive stain, simple stain. Um, I, I'm going to let you guys do that today. I think that that will be fine. I can do that. Don't need to rush it by any means. But one dye, you just see shape. All you can tell from that particular can infer anything. Um, now you can see like the rageness, whether it be staff or uh, stress. But yeah. I know everybody wants to see a lot, but just that one thing that's kind of limited what it can do. <laughs> Differential stains. The uh, gram stain uses two colors. So that's a good example of a differential stain for two dots. Special or structural stains just emphasize the structure or a cell part. Capsule stain that uh, I was talking about would be a good example, but remember the capsule is negative stain. So you can counter stain the organism and that's possible. You don't have to. Um, see the top example here? Cryptococcus neoformans. It looks like a bubble around it, but that clear part is what the capsule is. So they've stained everything else around. That's real pretty. Alright. You guys want to tell us? Do you want the. 
we'll do the, yeah, you guys take about 10 minutes, and then we'll do the review first. So if you guys want to kind of your stuff here.